Well, we're in Luke chapter 8. If you are joining us on the internet, then we give you a special welcome. And we're going to be reading a, a, an episode in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ from Luke chapter 8. And we're going to start at verse 26. Verse 26. Last week we were looking at the passage before from 22 uh, to 25 where Jesus calmed the storm, the winds and the waves, and he just calmed them with a word. And uh, as soon as he steps ashore from his boat trip, this is what happens. So Luke chapter 8, verse 26. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he'd broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus... They found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. Well, this is the word of the living God. If you have your Bibles open, please keep them there because we will be uh, referring back uh, to this passage. Um, so, how can I raise your hackles this afternoon? It's not that I, that I particularly want to irritate you. Uh, I can do that without making an effort, can't I? Um, I want you to think a bit about what you might say if you had the opportunity to encounter someone famous. This is what I mean by raising your hackles. Supposing uh, you met someone who was recognised as making a contribution to society and you thought, I'll give them a piece of my mind. Exactly what would you say? What would you do? That's our, our game to start off this afternoon. Um, let's try an easy one. Boris, our beloved Prime Minister. What would you say? What would you do? Now, I know at least two people whose hackles have risen. Their hair is now standing on the back of, up on the back of their neck just because I said, our beloved Prime Minister. So let's go to the opposition. What about Sir Keir Starmer? What would you say? What would you do? Or Dominic Cummings? Or Michael McIntyre? It's probably not fair to put McIntyre in the same category as Cummings. Or how about the young... Enviral, environmental activist Greta Thunberg would you encourage her or would you put her straight oh and how about Meghan Markle 
or Prince Charles. Now, of course, the reality is you ain't going to meet any of these people, are you? Uh, unless uh, you're very fortunate. Um, and, and it can, but it can be a, a pleasurable five minute daydream just thinking, well, if I met Boris, what would, what would I tell him? But even, even if we did meet any of these people, us telling them what we think would have no impact at all. Um, I think a far greater value would be of us just listening to either change or confirm our views on that person. Now, why have I, why have I started off like this? Well, it, it's because the verses that we read in Luke chapter 8, a number of people had an opportunity to encounter someone famous, someone who was recognised as having a contribution to make to society. It was a wide range of people that had the, this opportunity to encounter Jesus definitively the man who has made the greatest contribution to society that this world has ever seen. And those who met him ranged from those who needed healing through to those who were really concerned about a large business loss. They all saw Jesus close up and personal and there was a wide range of responses from them. And so this afternoon, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the power of Jesus that they saw. And then we're going to look at the response that they made to seeing that power. And as we go through, you might like to ask yourself a question. You might like to say, is that how I would respond if I had a close up and personal encounter with Jesus? So the first example of the power of Jesus comes with this encounter with the man who was demon-possessed. Now, I've known this story since I was so high. Um, I heard it in Sunday school, and uh, as such, I grew up with a sanitised version of this story. Now, you know, when you... Um, when you come across something you've met before, you've already got a mental image, yeah? And you, you, you've done this, you've talked to people on the phone, and then when you've met them, you've thought, they're not like, they're not anything like what I thought they were. You know, you've had that, I'm sure. And, and so I've got this mental image of this madman, and um, he's got a big long beard uh, with a loincloth, yeah, I know, but that's my image with a loincloth. And uh, he's rushing around from one tombstone to another, all crouched over. It's all very clean, it's all very safe. But that's nothing like the real thing. Verse 27 introduces us to a man who once lived almost as you and I did, in a house in town, but not anymore. His condition has deteriorated to such an extent that he's been driven out by his neighbours and now he lives among the tombs, naked, scavenging for food, cutting himself with rocks. That's what Mark's Gospel tells us. And at times so violent that the townspeople had tried to hold him down with chains. But his strength was supernatural and he managed to break even chains. Do you get the picture? There's nothing sanitised about it. A wild, ferocious man, probably covered in scabs and, score and sores, absolutely filthy, dirty, naked and terrorising anybody who approached him. We'd say he was a madman. The Bible is far more accurate. He was demon-possessed. Now in Sheffield in July 2020, we rarely encounter demon possession, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, or even that it doesn't occur near us. But that's not the point. In Jesus' time, in the New Testament days, people were controlled by evil spirits. And as we read through the Gospels, we regularly see Jesus casting out evil spirits. But this is a severe case of demon possession. We see here this crazy man with his wild antics 
And the source of his madness and his power is Satan. And he confronts Jesus, screaming at the top of his voice. Imagine, filthy, naked, scabby, long hair, beard, wild, screaming at the top of their voice. I'd be running. Verse 28. What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. It's the demon in the man that addresses Jesus. Interesting, isn't it, that Satan's army recognised Jesus. They acknowledge precisely who he is, even if they acknowledge him as the enemy rather than a friend. This man, the local mad person that everybody feared, comes screaming towards Jesus and then falls at his feet. And when Jesus asks calmly, what's your name? The demon spits back, legion. Because this poor man is possessed not of one, but of a multiplicity of demons. Now the previous night, Jesus had been in the boat. And a wild storm blew up. The wind and the waves had threatened to sink the boat and Jesus stood up and Jesus spoke just a word and the sea went flat he must be God if he did that hope the children finish that the adults of course haven't got a clue what I'm on about Jesus spoke in the boat just a word and the sea went flat now with just a word Jesus permits the demons to leave this poor guy. They need a home, so Jesus permits them to enter into a large herd of pigs. The pigs are so spooked by the demons that they rush down a steep bank into the Sea of Galilee and they're all killed. The man gets given some clothes. He sits calmly with Jesus, listening as the teacher continues. Verse 35, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. Now, is that power or is that power? A man that nobody could calm, cure or harness and Jesus deals with him so that his right mind is restored to such a degree that other people are happy to sit next to him. That is power, isn't it, on Jesus' part. That is power. Now there's much, much more that we could look at in that episode, but we're not going to. We don't have time. Because what I want to do is to look at two other episodes that happen immediately after that. In verse 41, we read of a remarkable thing. And uh, I, I really don't have to explain it much. Let, let's just read it together. Verse 41. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house. Because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. Then jump to verse 52. Jesus gets to the house, eventually. Uh, has been told that the girl is dead. Verse 52. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. A dead 12-year-old. And she was dead. The professional mourners were there, and... and and they knew their business. They knew a dead body when they saw it. 
someone would have been in the house and would have come out and said she's gone and somebody else would have gone and checked yeah she's gone and when Jesus came and said she's sleeping they laughed him to scorn they say who is this man what he knows nothing a dead 12 year old restored to life same question is that power or is that power and in between the demon and Jairus's daughter being raised from the dead there's an episode with probably a middle-aged woman he doesn't tell us but I'm guessing she, she's approaching middle age verse 42 Jesus has left the, the, the man who was demon possessed Jairus has said please come my daughter's dying so Jesus is on the way verse 42 as Jesus was on his way the crowds almost crushed him and a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Now, how many women have you met who would give their right arm to swap with this woman? For all the gynae specialists that we have today, for all the wonder drugs on the market, this is still a big problem for the NHS. And this woman... All she had to do was touch the edge of his cloak. Just a touch. Now, not only did she know instantly that she'd been cured. Actually, could you imagine the buzz in her body? All her senses suddenly are sharpened and enlivened. And she goes, I'm cured. Like... In an instant. Now, not only did she instantly know, but Jesus instantly knew that it had happened. Imagine that there's such a crush, such a crush, that people are continually bumping into Jesus, pushing him this way and that, and suddenly he stops and says, verse 45, Who touched me? When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding around and, and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touch me. I know that power has gone out from me. The power has gone out from me. Now that was power, wasn't it? Power to instantly heal a woman. Note that, instantly heal. A woman who'd suffered 12 years and not a single doctor could help her. Same question. Is that power? The previous night, Jesus in the boat, power over the elements, calming the storm with a word. Then, power over the forces of Slayton of Satan, casting out not one, but a multiplicity of evil spirits who'd enslaved a poor man, turning him into a raging monster. Then, as he heads off to Jairus' house, Jesus exerts power over physiology, healing a woman with a serious medical condition. She just touched his clothing. Then, power over the deadly enemy of death, raising a young girl to life surrounded by an incredulous group of mourners. I mean, could you imagine them when the girl makes an appearance at the window or comes out through the front door? The weather, the sea, the devil, the body and death. Nothing phases Jesus. It almost seems too easy. Now, we know that Jesus relied on God's power and the leading of the Holy Spirit. So in one sense, this is too easy. The full force of the Trinitarian Godhead is on display when Jesus heals, raises the dead and casts out demons. And who can withstand the full force 
of the Trinitarian Godhead. Is that power? But we must move along because we've thought about very fleetingly the power that Jesus has. And we said we'd then consider people's responses to that power. But do you remember the question that I also slipped in? I slipped in a question and I said, perhaps you'd like to think about, is that how I would respond if I had a close-up and personal encounter with Jesus? As is so often the case, Jesus divides society. We rarely see a, an, a unanimous response to Jesus. Most often we see contrasting responses. With the episode of the demon-possessed man, there are two totally different responses. With the woman, we only see her response. But with Jairus' daughter, we again see two contrasting responses. So what are these two contrasting responses? How do you fit in with them? Well, basically, if we bring it down to the lowest common denominator, people are either for or against Jesus. But it's more interesting than just a straight yes or no. So let's look at them. I'm going to do the no's first. And then before we close, we'll look at the yeses in, in a much shorter time. So let's think about the demon-possessed man incident. Here you have a man that everyone in the town knew about. We understand that. Why? Well, because it's obvious, isn't it? Children would have been warned by their mothers not to go to the tombs. As they grow up, they would have dared each other to go to the tombs and see if they could see the man. And then as they got a bit older, go to the tombs at night. And then as they got old enough to drink and the alcohol took, a scent, took, took its uh, toll on their body, uh, drunken young men would have said, let's go up to the tombs and let's have a bit of sport with the madman. Everybody knew him. And actually, we know everyone knows him because the Bible tells us that as well. Verse 35, and the people went out to see what had happened. They wouldn't have gone if they didn't know him. The word's gone round the town. That madman's been, uh, something's happened to him. You, could, you should come and see. They probably had a name for him. I don't know what it was. Now, wouldn't you think that the whole town will come out rejoicing? This man, they all knew him. They were all terrified of him and he'd been totally transformed. By the way, that is what Jesus does for people. Total transformation. I'm sure that you're not like this man that we're talking about. But you know you need changing, perhaps. When you come to Jesus in saving, trusting faith, Jesus will transform you. That is a guarantee. It may not be instant, it may be over time, but transform you, he really will. So, here is the town's madman. And he's sitting calmly, clothed, and hanging on every word of Jesus. And the townsfolk were thrilled and they praised God. Look, verse 36. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. Oh, not thrilled or praising God. Mm. In the boat the previous night, the disciples too were overcome with fear. If you look back on uh, the, the few verses before this story, you'll see that they were fearful, first of dying, then fearful of Jesus. They say to each other, who is this that even the waves and the winds obey him? But that was a reverent fear. That was a good fear. These town people 
with them it was a bad fear, a superstitious fear. And it could have been the fear of Jesus costing them something. Do you remember how the demons left the man? By moving into a large herd of pigs that rushed to their death in the sea. It's an interesting comparison, by the way, isn't it? Interesting comparison. Uh, life and sanity with Jesus. Death and destruction with Satan. Verse 34. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. Now, I don't think I'm being unfair to suggest that the herdsmen wanted the owners to know that they were not at fault for this loss. They went off and they told everyone and they would have told the owners, it wasn't anything to do with us. That man, Jesus, he did it. But nowhere in this episode do we see that the townspeople were glad that this man had been healed. There's more consternation about a herd of pigs than this restored soul. It seems that the pigs were more important than this man. And now Jesus had demonstrated, actually, that's not the case. Do you think, now that Jesus has made that demonstration very clear, do you think that some people would have been worried that Jesus might ask them to change their values? That Jesus might ask them to love this madman? Do you think that they were worried that there could be a cost to following Jesus. Would he get rid of any other of our possessions, like he's got rid of this herd of pigs? So rather than consider the cost, it's a lot easier to tell Jesus to go away. Is that your response to Jesus? Might he want you to change? That could prove costly. But what would trusting Jesus change for you? Only everything. Only everything. Primarily you'll get peace with God and a sure hope of sins forgiven and a place in heaven for all eternity. Compare that with some small cost on earth, perhaps the diversion of a few so-called friends. And compare eternity with Christ with eternity outside of Christ in the company of the demons that lived in this man. Compare heaven with hell. Is there really a decision to make? But I'm just wondering if there may be some who are trusting Jesus and they're, and they're struggling and finding it hard to keep going. The cost of following Jesus is, is for them right now quite high. My friend, do the same comparison. What do you have in Jesus? Primarily, you have peace with God and a certain hope of sins forgiven and, and a place in heaven for all eternity. That's not a small thing, is it? That's worth fighting for, I think. And compare eternity with Christ, compare that with eternity without Christ in the company of the demons that haunted that poor man. Compare heaven with hell. Isn't it worth sticking close to Jesus, even if the cost at the moment is a little high? But how can we stick close to Jesus, you say, when, when life is so turbulent? Well, you know that power that Jesus demonstrated over the elements, over the devil, over human frailty, over death? That power, you know that one? It's yours. I hope you know that already. Just keep reminding yourself of it. The Apostle Paul puts it like this uh, in Ephesians chapter 1. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people 
and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul is saying, I want you to know, I want you to see the incomparably great power that is available for us who believe. And he goes on to say, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. How can we stick close to Jesus when times are turbulent, when we're we're drawn away from him because the cost seems too high? Well, my friend, all the power of the Godhead is yours. All the power of the Godhead is yours to tackle sin in your life, to count the cost and to see the worth of following Jesus, to live for him as you truly desire. In Luke chapter 8, there were others who said no to Jesus. Actually, they laughed in derision at him. Verse 52, meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing she was dead. Jesus tells them the girl can be woken and they laugh at him. Don't they know what Jesus has just done for this madman? Don't they know his power? They must do. But when Jesus challenges them, they just laugh at him. My friend, don't laugh at Jesus. He demonstrates so clearly that he is who he is. He is God and he calls you not to send him away, not to laugh at him, but to trust him. That's the other response that we see to Jesus. And we finish it in only 60 seconds, I think. That's the yes vote. Jairus had a daughter who was dying. He trusted Jesus to heal her. When news came that she had died and there was no need for Jesus to go, what did Jesus say? Verse 50, hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. Jairus could have laughed at Jesus. He could have sent Jesus away. What did he do? He believed. The demon-possessed man was healed and he could easily have run off. What did he do? He believed. Verse 38, the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. My friends, Jesus calls us to believe him. There will be a cost. But Jesus puts all his power at our disposal. Power over Satan, power over the elements, power over death itself. And that power is there for you and for me to live our lives by. Are you using it? How are you responding to your encounter with Jesus? Let's pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for these vivid stories of the power of Jesus. Father, would you apply them to our hearts that we might be able to clearly see that we are called to believe in Jesus we are called really as as that madman was to go and tell others what Jesus has done for us and father there will be a cost because people will laugh at us people will take the mickey quite mercilessly out of us People will hurt us. But Father, help us to count the cost and help us to see what we gain in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Remind us again that we have at our disposal all the power that raised Jesus from the dead so we can believe, we can live lives close to the Lord Jesus that honour him and bring him glory. Lord, we're, every one of us is different we're all in a, a different place in our walk with you. We all have different struggles and trials. So our prayer this afternoon is, Father, let your Holy Spirit deal with our hearts. Let your Holy Spirit take these words and apply them to our hearts and make us different. Keep us more faithful. Help us to be more outspoken even in our witness and help us to rely not on our own strength but on the power that we have through the Lord Jesus. Father we thank you for this time we pray that you'll keep us as we go into the week we pray that you'll help us to walk close to you and Lord we ask that you will bless us and keep us safe because we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.